Thank you, everybody. Welcome, and welcome to the panel. So, ladies and gentlemen, as our panelists sit down, I just want to warn you, I'm quite astonished at the panel. Um, I'm going to go through the bios of these amazing people in just a moment. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to bring them together to do what we're about to do for the next couple of hours. And that is, on this topic of the view from 50,000 feet and taking a strategic approach to thinking about the domain for aeronautics, or said a different way, the aviation sector and where that sector is going, uh, to be able to bring this panel together to tease out a possible future scenario and to demonstrate in the process the sort of uh, strategic thinking uh, and the, the sort of issues that we need to grapple with. Um, that's what we want to do in front of you and with you over the next couple of hours. So let me go through the panel. And I'm reading in first name alphabetical order. Bob Whittington. Bob Whittington joined Amazon's Prime Air division in 2020 as the Vice President of Engineering Science and Technology. Prior to joining Amazon, Bob spent 34 years at Boeing. <laughs> Skiing off pissed here for a moment. I'm, I'm reliably insured he 34. is... 34. Sorry? 34. 34. I'm, I'm reliably insured that, that Bob is a, a, about as godlike as it gets when it comes to aerospace heritage because he was the chief engineer for the 787, the 777, the 767, the 737, and the P8A programs at Boeing. And Bob brings both the aerospace prime and the disruptive advanced air mobility perspectives to our discussion this morning. <coughs> Dr. Kiyoki Jackson, at the end, is the senior vice president and general manager for MITRE National Security Sector. Kiyoki came to that role after more than two decades at Lockheed Martin, where his roles included Chief Technology Officer and Chief Engineer. And I first got to know Kiyoki when he had the CTO role and was uh, part of the establishment of uh, Lockheed capabilities in Australia. Kiyoki's also spent time in the university research sector as a NASA research fellow at MIT. He's a fellow of both AIAA and the Re Royal Aeronautical Society. And he brings the perspectives of research and innovation, the aerospace primes, national security, and the mission assurance that the FFRDCs provide to this table. To Kiyoki's right is Linda. Dr. Linda Cadwell Stanson is currently the Vice President for Air Vehicle Engineering at Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Company. She previously served as the Vice President of Research and Technology in Lockheed's Chief Technology Organisation. She's been with Lockheed for the past six years, prior to which she led research and manufacturing technology at Spirit Aerosystems. Prior to Spirit, Linda worked for Boeing for many years, and she brings the perspective of the aerospace prime to this conversation, particularly in the area of air vehicle technologies. A couple of people, three people to my left is Dr. Michael Winter. Uh, Michael, just last week, was named as the chief scientist for the largest aerospace organisation in the world, RTX. RTX brings together Collins Aerospace Systems, Pratt & Whitney and Raytheon. And Michael is their chief scientist. His role involves responsibility for ensuring that RTX remains on the technology cutting edge. In conversations that he and I have had, I was delighted to learn that he and I share a common background. Uh, back in the day, we were both applying laser-based diagnostics to propulsion systems. Michael was previously chief engineer and principal fellow for advanced technology at Pratt & Whitney, among other roles and he brings the science and technology perspective of the aerospace prime to the discussion. To Bob's left, Nick Lapos. It's safe to say that Nick Lapos knows how to fly a helicopter. He's flown over 7,500 hours in them, including combat tours in Vietnam, won multiple medals and honours for his achievements, which include three world speed records. Do you still have those speed records, Nick? They still stand, yes. Still stand? That's awesome. Currently a Lockheed Martin Senior Fellow for Rotary and Mission Systems. Nick's also worked at Gulfstream and Bell. And I've had the pleasure of working with him in his role as co-chair of the AIAA Certification Task Force that reports to me 
in the aeronautics domain. Nick's an associate fellow of AAA, a fellow of the Vertical Flight Society, and he brings the rotary ring, advanced air mobility, end user, certification, and other perspectives to the conversation. Oscar Garcia, immediately to my left, has over three decades of aviation experience, including flying general aviation and wide body commercial aircraft, and running an airline and aircraft leasing company. He currently co-owns and runs Interflight Global Corporation, providing strategic, tactical, and governance consulting across the full spectrum of air and space startups, joint ventures, large aerospace firms, and public organizations in both the US and Europe. <coughs> Oscar plays a significant role in the international hypersonics community and leads a subgroup of the AIAA High Speed Flight Task Force that also reports to me. And he brings the high speed, the airline, the operations, and the business and finance perspective to the conversation. And last but not least, Dr. Vivek Lal. Vivek has over, over the years played significant roles at Raytheon, Boeing Defence Space and Security, Lockheed Martin, and is now currently the Chief Executive of General Atomics Global Corporation, which produces many unmanned aircraft and advanced surveillance systems, for example. Vivek has played senior advisory roles to NATO, to the US Cabinet Secretary heading the Department of Transportation, to the United Nations and many more, and has a series of extremely significant international honours and awards. He brings the perspectives of science, aviation, advanced aircraft technologies, business and government policy to the table. So you can see that there's quite a substantial brains trust here on the stage with me and quite a significant amount of experience across many aspects of the aviation sector. And together we're going to tease out the following scenario. So to my panel, thank you for joining us. What is that scenario? Many of you in the audience will remember from your early days the kids' TV show, The Jetsons. <laughs> and Some I believe that we'll have a, a slide on the screen just to, to reinforce. The Jetsons got many things right. There we go. The Jetsons is an excellent example of advanced air mobility solutions. They also got right modern architectural approaches. They anticipated Zoom. They anticipated FaceTime. They anticipated robotic assistance in the home. They were well before their time. And the scenario that we're going to address in the next hour and a half or so is the Jetsons meets 21st century. And in this 21st century, we have the enabling capabilities of artificial intelligence, which the Jetsons did not have. We have cyber technologies. We have workforce changes, which we discussed in the plenary this morning. Uh, we have global challenges, such as sustainability issues. So imagine that the Jetsons is catapulted forwards into the 21st century. What might that scenario look like? And let's not say that will never happen. It's probably the case of not if, but when. And maybe the scenario is not that far away. So what I'm going to do, starting from far left, working all the way uh, to this end, I just want to give each panelist about a minute each to give their initial reflections on what that future scenario, or how do they respond uh, personally to that future scenario? Kiyoki. Thanks, Russ. Uh, I, I was just reflecting. It's a little ironic being in this discussion sort of about the future of aviation. And I spent most of my career in the space world, and the airplane that I own is a 1947 Cub. So not exactly at the, uh, at the speed record uh, end of things. So what can I bring? I'd say, as I look at the discussion we're going to have here, I would start first with something that Russ mentioned earlier today, which is the systems and the systems of systems focus. And if we needed a wake-up call, let me just ask, was anybody in this room disrupted by the events of July 19th when the CrowdStrike uh, update kind of shut down a lot of the aviation sector. Did anybody struggle with that over the few days after that? So I'll just put that out there as a, maybe a starting point for the discussion as we think about the future of aviation 
and the view from 50,000 feet, what is it that it takes to make this system or system of systems safe, robust, resilient, and secure, incorporating all of the technological advances and engineering advances that we'll get a chance to talk about today? Thank you, Kyoki. Linda. Okay, I'm going to say one Lockheed Martin sentence, and then it'll be general after that. But uh, Lockheed Martin's mission is to accelerate global security and scientific human exploration by delivering reliable, innovative, and affordable solutions to our customers' most daunting challenges. We do that through a 21st century security strategy, which has technology roadmaps informed by mission roadmaps. And those technology roadmaps talk about, they show us these capabilities that you just talked about. I want to give three quick examples of now and the future so we could compare the two. The first one is the OSIRIS-REx team that won the Collier Trophy this year. They extracted a specimen from an asteroid in space. Huge, super cool, with robotics. In the future, we're going to be building communities, workplaces, energy transfer stations in space. And our aircraft will morph from flying at 30,000 feet to going to space in real time, right? So that's where we're going in the future. The second example is in the supersonic area. NASA's Quest mission, the X-59, has a very unique design which allows for quiet supersonic um, you know, no big supersonic boom, we hope, is going to be flying very soon. It's going to evaluate community response to the supersonic boom and allow us to set standards for noise for commercial supersonic flight. And so you'll be able to go anywhere in the world in half the time it takes today at Mach 1.4 and 55,000 feet. This last example is the X-62A Vista. And the X-62A Vista is a modified F-16 with AI live agents, which tests the ability for uh, AI-informed autonomous flight. It has flown uh, two dozen flights at least already, and it's establishing the standards so that we can regulate appropriately AI-enabled autonomous flight, and it won the Aviation Week Laureates Award. In the future, we're going to have a transportation system that is autonomous, adaptable, and intelligent. And I think that's going to be, and it's a flight-based system, and if we don't move there well, we'll all be on high-speed trains. So <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. Linda, thanks. Nick. So working for Russell and trying to do some understanding of what the future certification of the advanced air mobile aircraft uh, brings, we realize that we're not talking about aviation. If I could be disruptive enough, the idea of advanced air mobile devices bringing prescription drugs to a mother at three in the morning on the front step, or an army sergeant who releases a one pound UAV that flies over the next hill and sees what's there, are those actually aviation assets are they using the air in a way to change transportation and mobility in ways that we now can't see? The major disruption that we see, not only in the certification of the vehicles themselves, is also disruption in the way they're used. And it's entirely conceivable that in order to get full benefit of the advanced air mobile machines of the future that carry people or packages or prescription drugs or pizzas, that the disruption they bring will be to our air transport system overall. And in fact, one of the things we see is that the FAA is in a, a very difficult position of trying to adapt to this future world, which is they see and have the vision, but also understanding you can't disrupt today's world where 787s are bringing people into major airports. And how do you change those two? We'll develop that a little bit more fully in our report that's coming, but it, it does indicate to us that we're not dealing with aviation, if you will. It's actually a melding of what AIAA brings into everyone's life overall. Nick, thanks. Bob. I love aviation, right? It's been my life's passion. Um, and I look back at the car, the automobile and the airplane are about the same age. 
within you know a little tolerance and cars have become commonplace pedestrian everybody's got one airplanes are still cool because they hold that magic of flight i mean I doubt there's anybody in this room who doesn't look up every time an airplane flies over, right? I know I do, every time. And as we wander into our second century, I think we're gonna see that change. I think um, we have to go look at sort of a democratization of the airspace and where, where people are going to fly their own personal vehicles, where we're gonna get into air mobility, personal taxis, where you're gonna get your um, meds uh, or, or one of any other 10 million items from Amazon in 30 minutes, click to deliver. Um, and it's our job to go figure out how to take what's a very complicated machine operated by a very talented operator. Last week I was in Pensacola and I went to the Blue Angels air show. And, and it just, the, the, the roar and the thump of the engines, it, it really excites me as I go. But that's a very complicated machine operated by people who, who have their, spent their lifetime training in it. And, and I see our, the next century as, as trying to, as I say, democratize that, that airspace and make it simple. How do we make it as simple as driving a car? We've got to automate the systems, we've got to automate the airspace, and, and we've got to create a, uh, an environment where people with little to no training, more than it takes to drive a car, can take advantage of that airspace. And it's gonna get crowded, and I think we're gonna talk a little bit later today about how do we, how do we make that airspace, especially below 500 feet. You, know, you talk about the view from 5,000, and that used to be my life, and now I'm at 500 feet and below is my life. And so I'm talking about a view from 500 feet, and it's gonna get pretty crowded, and we need to figure out how, as engineers, we've gotta go make that safe and, and uh, accessible to everybody. So I would frame the state of the industry and the state of the technology in terms of four or five global mega trends. The first is the state of demand. Of all the 8 billion people on the face of the earth, fewer than 20% have ever set foot on an airplane. And as we see the rise of the middle class globally, all those people are going to continue to get on aircraft and the three and a half to 4% growth we see year over year will continue. On top of that, there's cargo. Cargo, there's about $6 trillion worth of cargo that moved in 2019 before the start of the pandemic. Uh, only half a percent of the volume was moved by air, but 35% of the value. And that number is forecast to grow by 60% in the next 20 years. So we are in a time of unconstrained demand, demand side, economics, which we really haven't seen in this industry since World War II. Number two is sustainability. Today, commercial aviation is responsible for about 2.6% of anthropogenic CO2. And there's a study by the International Civil Aviation Organization that shows by, with the growth that I just described, that becomes around 18 to 22% by 2050. Partly because land, right, uh, the grid, goes wind and solar, surface transportation goes electric, so the denominator is decreasing, but also the numerator is increasing. Number three is connected aviation, connected aircraft and aviation ecosystems. We start with model-based digital threads to design these machines. They're controlled in flight by those same codes. They call home and order their own spare parts. And then how that manifests, the spare parts are showing up on the flight line, decreasing the times for MRO uh, as well. And this can also manifest in terms of the asset availability for warfighting and transformation of kill chains to kill webs. Number four, the emergence of global super, the re-emergence of global superpowers and the rise of near-peer competitors. And we've seen this, we see this with uh, China, we potentially are starting to see it in India, certainly again with Russia, and that is also changing the face of how we need to manage ourselves and defend democracy. And then there's a fifth one, which is emergent, and I'm sort of lumping together AI and quantum. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk about those, but just as an example, as we're starting to see GPS-denied environments, 
Uh, it was recently, just last month, demonstrated the use of quantum spin states to do uh, essentially quantum navigation uh, when in GPS denied environments. So the reach of quantum, I think we're just starting to really understand it. Thank you, Vivek. So thank you, Russ. And by the way, excellent panel before this. Um, I want to take a little different tack on, on this uh, from a 50,000 foot level. Having been in the industry for the last 30 years, I see certain set of stakeholder buckets that need to be addressed as we look into the future with all the innovation and technology that's happening and what the panelists talked about. So the six buckets in my view, are, the first one is the political vision. And that can and will define where we go forward in any of these areas. The second would be the bureaucratic processes that are in place and the, and the bureaucrats and how, how some of these political visions are implemented. That's an important stakeholder group. The third would be academia, in, uh, the think tanks, AIAA, organizations in that category may not actually be on the decision-making org charts, but indeed will um, be one of the most important aspects of laying out the vision. The fourth, I would say, would be the media and perception. So we talk about supersonic flight, we talk about unmanned flight. Um, you need societal buy-in for, for a lot of that. And so uh, the media and, and the communications medium, they're very critical in all of this. Then the industry captains. You see many of uh, the folks, of course, at this conference, but the industry captains and where, what the boardrooms are thinking of where the future is from a business case perspective. That'll be very important in defining the future. And then I think finally the end user, no matter what these other stakeholders think of, if you cannot get the end user excited about a piece of technology that may be doable engineering wise or otherwise, but if the end user is not ready for it, we may be either too early or too late to the game. Thanks, Vivek. Oscar. Thank you, Russell. Good morning, and uh, it's an honor to be together uh, with all of you on this panel and the audience. Um, the world I live in is trying to solve uh, a problem. I, I would like to say it's a, a problem uh, that we all have, no matter where we are, who we are, or what we do. And the problem is that uh, if I ask all of you, how big is the world? Uh, probably the answer would be four days. Today, that's the time it will take you to fly anywhere across the world to an antipodal position, do some meaningful business, come back home. The world is four days big. The problem we're trying to solve uh, in my firm with the, the stakeholders we work with is how do we shrink the world? How do we go from a four-day world to a three-day world to a two-day world or even to a one-day world where anywhere on earth can be reached in one day meaningful business day and back on that single day. So we have a, a, a big, big uh, challenge, a big uh, a project to, for all of us to do. Uh, if you look at uh, the human uh, condition on our planet since, since we were able to fly jet aircraft in the 60s, if you look at the statistics from the uh, main indicators of quality of life, of uh, socio-political, stability and environment, you see that with the increase in speed that the jet aircraft brought to the world, all those elements improved. But for the past 50 years, we found a ceiling. We found a stagnation point where, again, if anybody, no matter uh, what socioeconomic level, you can be a trillionaire and you will still have a four-day world. So we're trying to solve that problem. We are trying to bring in technology and filter that technology into four dimensions that are essential to make any technology, even in readiness levels at the highest level. So we pass technology through the, what we call the pros filter. Policy, regulations, operations, and standards. We wrap that pro system in another S, which is safety. And with all those dimensions considered, we need to evolve the technology, the systems, the operations, the way we know it, the aircraft uh, that we are describing here on this panel, the safety levels, 
and try to, uh, what I say, shrink the world. So I hope uh, this panel uh, brings some, some insights into that conversation. And I look forward to hearing the audience uh, insights on, uh, to uh, paraphrase what Russell said earlier on the fireside chat, why do we want to shrink the world? And if we do, what are the intended consequences? But also take a look at what could be the unintended consequences and balance those as costs and benefits. So it's an honor to be here and I look forward to the discussion. So, so thank you. Let's have some, uh, let, let's map out the rest of this, the session for you. We have seven panelists. I have seven questions for them. And I'm going to address one question per panelist in turn. And that person will get a chance to respond to that question uh, as the first responder. But when they've had a go, the rest of the panel gets the chance to wade in. I'm immediately imagining one of my favorite Monty Python skits. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a wrestling competition in the mud. We won't quite go to the mud, but it's going to be an opportunity for some robust discussion, some interesting ideas. While that's taking place, if you have questions that are coming to mind, uh, you've got the link on the screen in front of you. You can put questions into the chat. We're going to have two audience question and answer slots, one towards the end of the first hour of the panel session and one towards the end of the second hour. So I encourage you to, to be prepared for that. Let's get into it. The first question I'm going to ask, I'm addressing to Bob. And Bob, for you, for that future scenario that we've just discussed and already teased out some of the issues a little bit, a technology question. What pieces of technology do we need to bring that scenario about? And of those pieces of technology, what have we got now and what do we still have to develop? Uh, <clears throat> it's fairly broad. Um, so in terms of technology, I, I, we've got to go figure out how to automate um, the operations and our operating environment. Um, I was surprised when I came from, I'll call sort of traditional aviation uh, into, into Amazon, and we've developed a very good computer vision system to help the drone uh, make sure it stays safe as it operates in a crowded environment. But the time it takes to go train your models using machine learning, the number of photographs you have to take, and the and the slight variations. If you decide you don't want to come into somebody's backyard with a package, um, when somebody's there, you have to tell your system what a person looks like or what the animals look like. And it turns out that depending on the time of year and the time of day and where the shadows are, you wind up taking thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of photographs. And you have thousands of hours of labor to label all those photographs. And, and you teach the, teach the system what a person is or what a dog is, so what an airplane is, um, what another unpiloted vehicle looks like. And, and that takes a tremendous amount of time. And so if we're gonna, if we're gonna say we're, we're gonna operate a lot of vehicles, we're gonna have personal transportation, the, the disruptor's gonna be the people who can use that automation in a, in a way that doesn't need all those labor hours to go do, right? So um, large language models, the, you know, the LLMs are not there yet. There's a lot of sludge at the bottom of the data lake. And, and you can't drag all that up and, and put it in place um, for safety critical systems. We're not there yet. And, and so I, I think um, the technology we need is to go out and, and figure out how to gather that data, how to train our systems in a way that's economic and, and quick. And, um, and then apply that in a way that takes the pilots out of the airplanes and, and, and makes the system automated. Um, I, I see a, uh, a system where we launch from our, our uh, warehouse out to Jane's house and we build a 4D tunnel. We, we register on, a, on the app and said, I'm gonna register a 4D tunnel that goes from here to there. And, and that desegregates, and everybody who's in that airspace can go use that, and we desegregate it. But that takes a, takes a lot of computing power and a, and a lot of technology that we don't have yet. A quick follow-on question to that. Are you using digital twins to help 
build... Sorry, are we using what? We're using digital twin technologies so to create the data and the scenarios that you can train the models with. We are using digital twins, yes. Um, and, and also to, to take that in, and put it into our manufacturing processes, right? Uh, we've got a fairly big... We're going to be building 40,000 drones a year um, in the next few, few years, and, and so building that digital twin and, and helping us uh, get to scale is, is a big deal for us. Nick. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, Bob and I haven't talked, no. but uh, the vision that we have in the certification committee is a different vision. One of the issues is that the FAA has handed to every air vehicle the responsibility for detect and avoid. So Bob is describing teaching a package how to see other packages. It's not necessary. If we build and set a network where every one of your vehicles and our vehicles, Sikorsky is building marvelous machines for this future world, if every one of those machines tied into a network and told its position, its identification, and its priorities, then the network could help to sort things out and talk back to your autopilot. The task then would not be to teach each package or each vehicle everything it needed to know, it'd be to have a network that was trusted and was real time to let these things occur. Is this done? Federal Express transports 20.5 million packages each day in the week before Christmas. I don't think any of those packages sees any other package, but Federal Express knows where every package is within a few meters during the entire journey. The object then is to hand the responsibility away from each air vehicle into a network and have the network sort out and have the computing power necessary and pass back the advisement to each of the vehicles with regard to what's around you and how to avoid it and have autopilot links so that each of the vehicles, autopilots, would not allow the vehicles to bump into each other. This is done, how would you put the maximum number of ball bearings into a box? One of the ways is put them in the box and shake the box. If you think about the air traffic system of the future, it could be like a drone show today. I've seen 3,000 drones make beautiful pictures of ducks and cats, and they never bump into each other because they're networked together and all of them fly together in this space. Now, I'm going to stop there and say that vision means we have to change the whole concept of the air traffic system. But why not? Would you take the system that controls trains and apply it to airliners? We're in a different world. So, Nick, I can see at least two people on the panel itching to now respond. Yeah. And I think, Michael, I noticed you itching first. And, Kyoki, you had your hand up. Let, let's go in that order. So it's fascinating listening to Nick and to Bob talk about this. I'm going to try and bring us back to the 50,000-foot level because it's, it's important when you think about new technologies, especially as we apply it to a safety-critical industry such as ours, is that there's, you can always think about technologies in terms of four quadrants. There's existing technology in an existing market, and then up here there's new technologies in a new market. And what's always easier, as, as somebody who's, most of us probably have been doing technology our whole lives, what's always easier is to use existing technologies to access a new market, as Nick is describing, or to try and um, to establish um, an a, a existing market with a new technology. Okay? But trying to do both at the same time is just really hard. And so when we think about sort of how do we approach these challenges, it's always important to sort of pick, pick your risk and choose your technology risk relative to the market risk. Okay. 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 Well, first, I gotta say, I really, I like the vision, and I think that's where we need to go. The question is, how do we get there from where we are today? And you know, I, I just, as you think about, for example, the application of automation or the application of new framing of networks, just want to give a few examples. So I already talked about uh, you know, a minor software update that kind of brought down 86 million computers across the world. But that's just one example. Uh, Take, for example, the NOTAM system going down. This was January of 2023. Again, essentially shut down big chunks of the airspace for a couple of days. For what you might consider something of an ancillary system to direct safety of flight in the, in, in the moment. You also have to think about the infrastructure. 
And uh, so take the Colonial Pipeline uh, cyber attack or ransomware attack. That essentially shut down a lot of the fuel, including aviation fuel, to the East Coast, supplying at least seven airports uh, from Atlanta to Charlotte. So you think about that infrastructure. And then think about some of the network effects. And a lot of the things that Nick talked about, you know, think about systems like ADSB, reliant on global uh, uh, satellite navigation systems, GPS in particular. Um, just in the last couple of years, we've had a couple of major interference outages, Denver, Dallas, Fort Worth, in sort of 50 mile radius areas that have effectively shut down some of the applications that all of those rely on. So again, how do we think about re-architecting and redesigning these systems so that, it, and it's not just about things like redundancy, but fundamentally allowing them to reheal uh, in the case of these kinds of disruptions. And I haven't even got into what I'd call the conflict and war scenarios, which add a whole different yeah. layer of complexity. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Nick, I, I, I appreciate your vision and where you want to be. If I wait for you to, to go implement that vision, I'll be out of business. So, right, I've got to have, we, we have to have a system that, that's quicker than that, which, which um, engages and integrates within our current system. Um, I'm planning on delivering 500 million packages by 2029 per year. That's great. And, and, yeah. and so if I wait for sort of the traditional mechanisms to go create a new airspace thing while I'm done, um, the, the, dis the other disruptors that are coming up from underneath will, will wipe me out. Just, I absolutely respect that, understand it, and agree. We must move forward today because today's system is the one that's there. And if you ask to disrupt the system for a future that might or might not be, you end up with chaos. So I absolutely agree. Second thing is, please recognize, if every air vehicle has detect and avoid built into the air vehicle, the economic threshold of that vehicle is at some level that means you must carry a lot more with it and it spends a lot more. The vision would be that you could also, if you had a network system, the network uh, uh, connection and instructions might be 5% of the cost and therefore your vehicles get smaller, cheaper, and easier to use. Agreed. So I picture the beginning is what you're describing and no one wants to stop that. Not the FAA, no one. On the other hand though, if you were to design the future system based on the limitations of today, you'll end up with the limitations of today carried through for the next 200 years. Yeah. I'd offer up that the interstate highway system was designed around 70 mile an hour cars. It was not designed around 20 mile an hour cars or horse buggies. We have to be careful that the transportation systems of the future are designed for the capabilities of the future. The network system I described, all those technologies exist. There are two or three vendors have demonstrated it already. So the real question would be, how do you turn that into reality and do it in time so that you don't end up sinking your expense into hundreds of thousands of vehicles that each carry $30,000 with detect and avoid that didn't need it? So, Oscar, I'm not going to go to you because it's, it's a choice of either moving to the next question or extending this session until probably 3 o'clock this afternoon. There's, there's clearly a lot, of, a lot of stuff starting to bubble up here. Uh, but, Oscar, whatever you were about to say, it's gonna, I'm sure it's going to come out in the mix. So yeah, over the next allow me little while. very quickly. My concern is that technology development is outpacing the policy and regulation That's it. Yes, framework. So, like AIAA, uh, as it. a standards development organization, has a lot of long solutions long term, yeah? uh, for that problem. The, the outpacing of technology is, is a concern for the capital decision makers. Yeah, good. I'm going to take the next question to Michael, and it's the same question as the first question, but take out the word technology, and to our newly minted Chief Science of Scientific Officer for RTX, Michael, what are the key pieces of science that are needed for this future world, this future scenario, and, and what are we still needing to, to grapple with? So, so I, want to, I want to start just by a little bit of contrast mentioning technology and mentioned two uh, recent changes over the last decade or so, and that is Airbnb and Uber. And the point is that there wasn't any new technology needed, but it was a new market. It was the opportunity to connect uh, unused capacity with 
unfulfilled demand. And that, right, that's a, a good example of a use of technology into creating a new market. Now, in terms of flight, if we think about the vehicles that we fly today, starting with the sort of the, the very light drones all the way through urban air mobility to carry a couple passengers, a couple kilometers, now you're shifting by a few orders of magnitude in energy storage when you leave the ground. If I keep going up um, by another, say, two orders of magnitude, I've got about the amount of energy stored in a Prius or, or maybe even a Tesla. If I go up by another two orders of magnitude, I have the amount of energy that a frigate has when it leaves the port. And if I go up another two orders of magnitude from that, so we're at about eight zeros here now um, in terms of um, uh, kilowatt hours, then we're talking about an A380 leaving the ground to do a long range mission with essentially hundreds and hundreds of people on board, um, phenomenal mass to carry forward. And as a society, we are really not good at storing energy, right? We've been relying on these hydrocarbons, which are actually really good, right? 44, 45 megajoules per kilogram. Um, interesting, if you look at two other species that fly, uh, that we share planet Earth with, uh, um, goose fat is 32 megajoules per kilogram, and honey is 12 megajoules per kilogram, just for reference. Batteries are about uh, 40 times worse today. Yeah. And in an interesting article that some of us published about a year and a half ago in Nature um, by uh, Venkat Yetming, um, John Langford, Marty Bradley, uh, uh, Esther Taguchi, and myself, I think I got everybody, um, we looked at, the, the title was, The Challenges and Opportunities of Battery-Powered Flight. And what we saw, one of the observations that we made in that article was that all of the known battery chemistries that we use today come from just two columns in the periodic table of the elements, right? When Mendeleev came up with the periodic table, it was about the properties of matter. And so we're doing this really just tapping into a very small subset of the properties of matter. And so the ability to store energy is gonna be critical, especially for the aviation industry across all domains. And that's why we're starting to see for space, as an example, um, the reintroduction of nuclear to go longer distances and longer missions. I'll also just mention um, hydrogen storage. Uh, hydrogen at 122, 121 megajoules per kilogram is three times the energy density of jet fuel, but it's four times the volume. And so you need to store it as a cryogenic liquid, um, minus 253 degrees centigrade. Um, there's some interesting work that was done um, about three decades ago that looked at capillary condensation, essentially using carbon nanotubes to um, condense hydrogen to a liquid state at room temperature. Uh, it was demonstrated in the laboratory and nobody was able to repeat it. There was a reemergence about 10 years ago of a whole series of papers where people again were able to demonstrate in the laboratory. Again, it was not re so there's, there's some science there in terms of sort of the, the properties of hydrogen that we really don't understand. So focusing for aerospace on energy storage. Others? Vivek and Linda. Linda first. I have a question for you. How do you see nuclear or fission playing in the future for uh, commercial transportation? Whatever technologies we introduce for flight will be as safe or safer than anything flying before you. And so the question is, can those technologies be brought forth en masse with airplanes taking off and landing of order every half to a quarter second today and those numbers to be growing even greater. Um, can you do that with fissionable material? Uh, we've gotten to a phenomenal safety record, but it's not zero. And you know, those of us who work in certification know that while we strive for perfect engineering perfection, um, you don't actually get that. The, the basis of safety for commercial certification is one part in 10 to the ninth, one in a billion. 
right? Is that going to be tolerable with fissionable materials that could end up on somebody's property or um, in, in an urban setting? So I think it will likely remain a challenge as long as we're faced with the constraints we have. I think there's a cost and weight play there that you have to go Absolutely. through that as well as, right? As you ramp up the orders of magnitude on your battery storage, it keeps getting more and more expensive. And, and uh, depending on where you're using it, in a satellite, you'll pay for the weight. Um, we're delivering your aspirin, I won't. So, so I'll, I'll just add, our biggest manufacturing facility is in Middletown, Connecticut. And if you ever go there, it's way out in the middle of nowhere. There's a road that's like, I don't know, five miles long to get to it. And that's actually the site where the first nuclear propulsion system for an airplane was built. And the United States government at the time had a con ops where that airplane was going to fly, and then there was going to be another airplane that followed it with the cleanup crew. Okay. So this was back in the 1940s, I guess, <laughs> the 1950s. So just just to add to that, um, I, I think Michael brings up a very important point in terms of energy storage, of course. And, and I, I admire Linda's question because I think the lines between aviation and space are going to blur in this regard. So as you, as you know, in space, there's a lot of work, and, and we're doing some of that in nuclear thermal propulsion as well as nuclear electric propulsion. And I do feel our, our fission power on the surface of moon and, and reactors for that, I do feel that the science and technology, those lines will blur eventually into aviation. Uh, and I do think that the, the key aspect that Bob brought up too is of course gonna be the cost point. I think technology wise, we will get there uh, as we look into the future, but the, but the cost point has to be kept in mind as well. Mm. I'm going to move to the next question. And this question, Nick, it's for you. Now, you've already partly answered it, but I'll give you another go at it. We'll grade you on this, uh, this second attempt. So it's an implementation question. What are the gaps in certifying, regulating, and managing such a future transportation system? And how should we go about addressing them? You, you have already started on that, but let's hear a little bit I've more. talked about it. And, and uh, let me offer up uh, some comments we heard here some great discussion about the fact that, gosh, you can't have a battery-powered 380. We understand that. In fact, one of the things I'd offer up is the challenge that we have to face is a societal answer to the questions about emissions, not an individual answer for every single vehicle. That, in fact, the society may decide that fossil fuels work very well in some areas, and as long as it only represents, say, 5 or 10% of the total emissions of the society, it may be acceptable. And in fact, we have to, I think, govern ourselves with that in mind um, and offer up the fact that fossil fuels, gasoline, is five times the energy density of dynamite. Now, Michael mentioned the number of joules per kilogram, but that sort of puts it on a, a level to realize that is the heroin that drove our society for 200 years to get where we are today. And it's gonna be hard to break that habit unless we recognize ways to get around it. So what are some of the barriers? Number one is the barrier is the fact that many of the innovative companies today that are trying their hands at air vehicles of various sizes have no idea what the FAA certification system is like. So one of the things that a committee did, we just sent the report to Russell late, but but it's in his inbox, is that we think the AIAA could serve as an information clearinghouse and expertise to help the industry. So people in Silicon Valley who have no idea how you build a flying machine, but know how to make something fly, can deal with some of us who have been in this tough world for a long time to help shape their submittals, to help shape their designs with the right FMEAs, and to get them much more likely to be uh, certified quickly. So the AIAA serves as an information clearinghouse. That same clearinghouse could serve as the chair to committees to help advise the FAA and NASA about where to go in the future. There's a GAO report on the street that talks about the fact that the FAA has not considered the business requirements of the future advanced air mobile machines. In fact, one of the problems is the FAA's rules today would exclude probably about one-third of the urban environment's land area 
post office boxes, mailboxes, so that you can't go Package Express underneath the ILS path to Teterboro. And if you can't do that, then it means that you have to figure out how to make money with the rest of them and exclude those people. We think the idea of having this advanced network system sometime in the future would be that it lets you do time variable airspace denial. So when a 747 is on the ILS, nobody goes near them. But when they're not using the ILS, then the package express flits around and delivers packages and otherwise forbidden airspace. So we think that the idea, two things, number one is certification information, and number two is the idea of an airspace system that allows all users to have some use of all the airspace some of the time. And I'll stop. So Nick, Nick thanks for that. You, you, made a, you made many important points. One of them was that there are plenty of people in Silicon Valley and other places who now have, know how to build something to fly, but they don't know how to build it such that the FAA would certify it. Let me twist that a little bit. And let's bring in, instead of the, the, the FAA's perspective, what about the venture capitalist's perspective? Are there plenty of people out there who know how to build something to fly, but don't know how to build it such that anybody would want to invest in it, and therefore it will still never get off the ground? And as a community, uh, and in fact, can AIAA assist with that process as well to help the technologists understand how to create something, how to innovate in a financeable way, and not just a cool technology way? So, question for the panel. I'd love to answer that question. So, so the, the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, the, the role in certification is to administer, not to disrupt, not to promote, not to create. So it's up to us as an industry to bring to the FAA not only the technology we want, but the means of compliance of that technology going forward. If you look at the space industry, commercial space industry since 2004, the last 20 years, again, the technology has outpaced so much the certification know-how and knowledge from the FAA both aviation and Office of Commercial Space. And I'm very glad this year AIAA has chosen to bring aviation and space together because both realms can inform each other. So if you look at the commercial space industry, FAA uh, regulation system, there is not yet a certification system. Right. But it's up to us in industry to create the consensus, voluntary industry standards that we deliver to the FAA as means of compliance for the technologies that we have achieved, whether it's automation, whether it's propulsion. So what I'd like to, to offer for everybody's consideration is we have to change the paradigm, we have to shift the paradigm where we do not wait for the FAA, the regulator, or the policy makers to give us the solution to scaling and commercializing technology. Let's bring those solutions together with the technology we bring to the table. And that is where AIAA can shine in terms of the consensus standards, capabilities that is approved by Congress, that is, uh, follows all, all the metho uh, methodologies to be means of compliance. I'm very, very passionate about this subject because the billions of dollars we need to enable certain technologies like high-speed flight or advanced air mobility, billions with B in double digits will not come until we show decision makers for capital, that we have not only technology solutions, but compliance solutions too. And just to add to that, I think the timelines for certification way exceed now the, the technology leaps that are happening in the time cycle. So as part of that solution, I completely agree AIAA can have a very significant impact, is how do you shrink timelines uh, in, the, in that uh, endeavor? Maybe just to, to, to give it a, a finer point, um, and I'll talk about hybrid electric just because I've talked about that previously. Um, today, the certification chapters for the electrical system on board an aircraft and for the propulsion system are separate and completely separately defined. Right. And so today, um, we and others are actively working on demonstrator programs for a regional turboprop, which is a 50-50 hybrid. We're working uh, in partnership with Airbus and others on a single aisle, which is a mild hybrid, 
of at about 5%. And when the propulsion system is reliant and interdependent on an 800 volt bus, I mean, that's, that's some, there are no chapters for that. And so the key is, is back to what you said, and that is show the alternate means of compliance. And if you do it right, you can show that by the synergy of these, you actually bring redundancy to the safety system, and so that it's actually safer with this on board. Now, AIAA plays a role in this. SAE is sort of championing, um, focusing on what the new chapter structures should look like for certification. But this comes down, I mean, we're facing this right here, right now, this decade to certify um, turboprop aircraft and into the next decade for single aisle. I'm going to switch laptops now, and I'm hoping there's some audience questions that have piled up on this one. And we'll, we'll, just, we'll just take one, and I'll put it to the panel at large. <laughs> and then we're going to have a quick stretch your legs break, but noting that we've locked the doors. <laughs> you, you cannot leave. So let me refresh this. It's thinking. <laughs> I once had an experience at a conference where I got up on stage proudly with my Apple MacBook Air, this iPad still thinking, and I unplugged the PC that was there and said, now we'll work with a real computer. And at that point, just to spite me, the battery in my laptop exploded. And it took half of my allotted slot to speak to sort the problem out. It was quite disturbing. Okay, so this iPad is, uh, is refusing to connect to the internet, so I'm going to assume that there are no audience questions at the moment, but we do have another slot for it at the end. So I'm going to in invite everybody to just take 10 deep breaths, stand up, stretch. We'll, we'll just have a couple of minutes uh, just to, uh, to take a break. Um, but I am not encouraging you to leave, although, of course, the doors are not locked. Uh, and, and we'll return to the, order, to the, uh, the panel questions Technology. in just a moment. Let's go for this one. And this is a question to the panel in general. What should we be doing to make transportation, air and multimodal, more resilient to climate change impacts? Who would like to take that? Nick. I'll start. And then Kiyogi. I think the overriding theme, the elephant in the room for the previous session was the question of how do we adapt to advanced, I'll use the word green technologies for want of something else. And, and then from that we went on to discuss all the details. But in point of fact, the idea that the emissions of the vehicles are an important measure of the vehicle's performance is absolutely essential. And I must also say this, and it's something we have to recognize, we always balance the future vehicle, like the battery-powered air vehicle, against today's machine. And today's machine is not tithed with the expense of the effluent that it throws into the atmosphere. We buy a gallon of fuel, and we spend a given amount for it, and then we burn it, and no one looks back and says, well, you just caused this much damage, and that has to be recovered. It's my belief that one of the ways the society will end up creating a proper economic balance for the future is to create at the pump the expense for the damage that the fuel created. And I realize I sound like um, that next generation uh, sailing across the Atlantic rather than flying an airliner. And I don't mean that at all, but rather the genuine technical cost of burning a gallon of fuel should be considered when you buy the fuel. When I buy a battery, I pay the core charge for the lead in the battery additionally to the battery itself. So when I bring the old battery back to be recycled, I get the core charge back. Is there a core charge for a gallon of gasoline or a gallon of jet fuel? If that were done, the society would have an easier job balancing the equations. And of course, a harder job passing the bill that charged the core charge. 
Michael, I know yeah, you want I, to answer, but Kiyoki, you had your hand up before. You now, Nick raises uh, some really interesting questions. That gets into sort of these costs of externalities, and then that gets into, as Oscar talked about, some of the challenges in terms of policy and regulation as you think about long-term sustainability of these different solutions. But I would offer, you know, in addition to sort of the green technology challenges, there are increasingly called practical challenges today. Just think about the impacts of extreme heat events. Um, you know, and and you know, th this is uh, obviously a technological uh, uh, a sprint to get ahead of some of these things, but we've seen cases where you know, certain aircraft types have been grounded in certain regions uh, because they're outside of their operating regime. Uh, now, there are technological solutions to all that, but we should anticipate that these kinds of challenges become even more prevalent over time. Similarly, if you think about you know, longer-term views on you know, what might or might not be underwater, uh, particularly in our coastal areas, and the implications for multimodal transportation, these are uh, big systems challenges that we're going to have to think through as well. I, I think Ma Michael first and then Linda. So um, put things in perspective, 30 to 40 percent of the cost of running an airline is fuel. and It always has been. 30 to 40 percent of the cost of running a modern Air Force is also fuel. And our industry, since the dawn of flight, has been focused on efficiency of the systems we provide. And airplanes and engines have been getting better by one and a half percent on average forever, forever. Since Von Ahn and Whittle flew the very first jet engines 85 years ago, the thermodynamic efficiency has improved by 400%. And we do see a lot of runway to continue that. We also have some solutions in terms of sustainable aviation fuel. Now, Nick raises the point about cost of carbon emissions, cap and trade systems. They are going in place. For example, in the European Union, um, under the Refuel EU program, they are uh, specifically starting to implement a cost of carbon for jet fuel within Europe. Uh, Corsia is phasing in right now the um, carbon offset and regulation scheme for, um, um, Corsia, for, for civil aviation. Um, and, and that is also will be monetized starting in 2028. And the other approach that the United States has taken with the current administration is an incentive which is a blender's tax credit for producing sustainable aviation fuel up to about $1.25 per gallon. And so uh, political systems have either gone with carrots or sticks to implement this. The aviation industry as a whole has committed to net zero by 2050. The path to get there is a challenge and it will take a tremendous amount of uh, development, especially of sustainable aviation fuel, as well as alternative technologies. And I'll just also mention, it's not just carbon, there are also non-CO2 effects. Um, ozone is a greenhouse gas. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Oxides of nitrogen may or may not be a greenhouse gas, and um, depending on which papers you read. And contrails, uh, which form behind the airplane, um, while with a lot of uncertainty, are believed to be potentially as bad as CO2, they only persist to six to 10 hours, whereas CO2 hangs around for centuries, and yet it could be as bad. Mm -hmm. And there, we need to understand that uncertainties better and develop that science. Just, no. I guess what I would say is that we need to attack it aggressively right now, and there's, there's uh, no excuse for not attacking it. And what we're doing, for example, is we've got advanced modeling and simulations uh, with artificial intelligence, virtual development labs. And so we're going after flight test and development test and trying to get to near elimination. I know our pilots are probably not happy with that. Um, <laughs> but that's one thing we're doing, is trying to reduce that part of the uh, emissions uh, with simulations and uh, training with simulations and flight test with, through simulations versus actual flight test. Just to add to um, what Michael said, sustainable aviation fuel or electric or hydrogen, and I, I do agree there are a lot of gains there. 
I'd encourage you to look at the whole uh, life cycle of the development rather than a point design because oftentimes you, you do get cleaner, so to speak, energy at a particular point design. But if you look at the life cycle, whether it's batteries or other things, the, the total impact to um, the environment has to be assessed. Let's move on or I will declare that the session is not going to finish until 10 p.m. tonight. But I would love to capture the data, the, the, the insights that would come if we did extend it that long. Oscar, I want to ask you a question. And I want to do it from the perspective of the marketplace now. What could be the number one issue that the developers of the technology and the airspace management systems should be firmly fixed on in order to take into account the perspective and needs of the investor and the end users to achieve commercial viability? Yeah, yeah. Great question. Uh, the, the, um, the top, top uh, challenge I see to, to proliferate scale and, and evolve uh, uh, new technologies in aerospace, where safety is the main driver, um, is to find a way to harness three vectors. I, I feel that the capital decision makers look at technology, technology evolution through the readiness levels, look at market demand, and when those two start meeting each other, immediately look at three vectors. Look at the policy vector. Is this going to be scalable? Can it proliferate into the societal uh, market evolution? They're looking at the regulator. Who is going to administer and take liability for the use of that technology? And then looks at the technologist to make sure that the technology can evolve. If you look at those three vectors in sustainability, in terms of uh, safety, in terms of service to the community, there are oftentimes misalignment, uh, misalignments of the vectors. So top priority would be to, to wrap those vectors around a super vector that I call the voluntary consensus standards, norms of behavior, best practices. That capability gives investors and capital decision makers the assurance that the policy, the regulation, and the technology, no matter how misaligned might be, could be aligned into a process that would scale up the uh, market use and return on investment. So that top of my list, and AIAA is a perfect forum to, sh to share that thought. Uh, industry voluntary consensus standards are a solution to give the capital decision makers the confidence that the policy, regulation, and technology vectors are aligned. So that's, that's uh, please, any help uh, the capital markets can get from, from uh, uh, all the stakeholders involved, uh, we will unleash the capital required, which is in the, again, billions in the double digits. Not, not a few million dollars from Silicon Valley uh, curious uh, parties. We are talking about industrialization level uh, in, uh, investment. Nick, will you? Yeah, I'm going to pick up because I think it's a very nice uh, uh, triumvirate of issues. And the third one, technical. I believe the AIAA serves as a very good clearinghouse for technology because Unlike the applicants who come to you with their very best pig in a polka dot dress, the AIAA serves as a group of technicians and scientists who can comment um, in a way that does not have political implications or have monetary implications. It is technical only. And the only other clearinghouse I see that does that as well is NASA that it would seem that a confluence of uh, AIAA and NASA could serve as the clearinghouse for the FAA and for other regulatory agencies to understand where the technical, the best technical solutions seem to exist. And I, I offer up that what we in the committee had done was to say the AIAA probably serves as the best clearinghouse on the civil side of the equation for that. Kiyoki, is there opportunity for the FFRDCs in that conversation? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, for folks who may not know the term FFRDC, that stands for Federally Funded Research and Development Center. 
And there are over 40 of these operated across the federal government, several in the Department of Defense. Uh, MITRE operates the National Security Engineering Center. I see my friend Paul Nielsen out there who leads uh, uh, the Software Engineering Institute out at Carnegie Mellon. I've seen a handful of uh, aerospace corporation folks here already this, uh, today, and they do uh, also systems engineering uh, for the DOD. But these also include uh, FFRDC and FFRDC for the Federal Aviation Administration, the Department of Transportation, uh, and other parts of the federal government as well. And so I'll put out there that this is one of those in-between kinds of opportunities to sit between government, the technology sector, and private industry and be able to help with that overarching uh, you know, sort of collaboration, integration, and balancing of different priorities. Now, these are extremely different, uh, difficult challenges. And uh, you know, I would say we've talked a little bit about things like certification and the challenges there. Two things I'd want to point out. One is if there truly is a demand, and I, I do believe the, the demand arguments have been made uh, both uh, uh, by Michael and Bob, I mean, that's real. Somebody will service that demand, and if it doesn't happen in the U.S., it will happen someplace else. And I think just uh, the example of how quickly uh, China has moved to really dominate electric uh, automobile production, uh, maybe faster than any of us expected, is an example of what might happen in other places as well. So if we can't sort out the regulatory and policy aspects here, we might anticipate that somebody else will get there sooner and, uh, and establish a significant head start in manufacturing uh, production de deployment as well. Uh, the other thing I'd say is I believe there are some technology solutions uh, to some of these systems engineering challenges. And uh, I got to hand it to AIAA. One of the things that AIAA has been working in terms of the, uh, the curriculum standards is inserting things like modeling and simulation, which are increasingly used to get after all of these complex and interconnected problems. So we'll see that as part of uh, kind of the standard of what we expect from the folks coming out of universities uh, in, in the future. But we can also use these technologies, and, and, and I had the opportunity to lead a study for the National Academy of Engineering um, and Department of Defense on the, rain, the, the test and evaluation ranges of the future. But this applies, I think, regardless of whether it's a DOD or a civil case. Technologies like artificial intelligence, like advanced modeling and simulation that might someday rely on quantum computers to get after these very, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, computationally challenging kinds of problems, increasing the use of live virtual and constructive technologies much more broadly than we've been able to do it today. And you see some examples in DOD around things like the joint simulation environment that I think are just the beginning of, uh, of where we're headed. These are the kinds of things that will allow us to tackle both in the small sort of the platform uh, kinds of issues, but also in the large, the integrated system of system challenges and get to a faster and more rigorous certification regime that we really can't address in the way we decompose our problems today and the way we add them back up together. That is an extremely <coughs> long and arduous task that honestly doesn't get after some of the challenge we see, for example, in certifying, certifying automation today. So I think for the certification, we need an, a non-political voice that goes out. We, we have to talk about what safety means. When we, when we talk about advanced uh, air mobility, what does safety mean, right? We, you talked about in, in uh, piloted aviation, we put passengers on board. We talk about one in a billion as our design criteria. And everybody that understands that, everybody knows it. Um, when somebody dies, right, it, it, it has a, a, a reaction that's much greater than, for instance, the 50,000 people we kill every year driving cars. Um, yeah, but, but it's in a, the U.S. alone. In the U.S., in the U.S., right? Alone, yes. Uh, in the U.S. alone. And, and part of our certification challenge in the air mobility world is there are no um, agreed-to standards. We haven't agreed that 10 to the minus 8th, 10 to the minus 7th. General aviation is currently sort of 10 to the minus 6th. Um, and, and without that, every time there's an accident, 
there's a potential to over rotate and shut down the entire industry because we haven't agreed on what safety means. And, and it's increasing pressure to have zero be the only okay answer. And, and everybody who's been in this industry knows there's no such thing as zero. You can't get to zero unless you just park them. So is there an ethics conversation that's needed? I, there is a, that conversation, but, but nobody in a political environment can stand to have the conversation. And, and like it or not, the FAA is not non-political. Right? And so um, I, don't, I don't know. I think you know, it would be great if, if, if AIAA could sort of take that on. MITRE's in a pretty good position. They've got connections. And we, we are working with MITRE uh, in a couple of areas. But, but somehow, before we can really reach what we all know is aerospace certification standards, you have to set the upper limit of, of where you want to be. And, and if you make it 10 to the minus ninth, I think we price ourselves out of business. So um, it, it's, a, it's something that needs to happen. And, and I don't see the, the conversation happening anywhere because it's politically too sensitive. Nick, very quick question from you. Very briefly. Com comment from you. Yeah. yeah. Um, certainly, I absolutely agree. And in fact, one of the problems is the AAM world of the future will have an order of magnitude more vehicles than today. Yeah maybe two orders of magnitude more. If that's true, then holding today's practical standards about 10 to the 7th is actually the number for today's air transport system. If you hold those numbers and then you put uh, 100,000 vehicles flying in the United States, you end up having um, a reportable headline in every city every day. And that's what Bob's point is. It, it probably will bring the system to a halt unless there's some understanding of the reality of the numbers. And I have no answers. <laughs> Let's move from one tough challenge to the next one. And Linda, let me ask you a question. Transportation systems are not just commercial and civilian activities. They have dual use implications and the scenario that we're discussing will be no different. So what do you think the opportunity for enhancing national and international security and stability is going to be and, and, and the, the challenges around that? Okay, yeah, there's a definite um, intersection between security for commercial travel and security for defense. Um, in addition, uh, speed and the need for speed and innovation. And then finally, sustainability. Well, the finally actually is well, what I'll call egality or an equality aspect. And I want to talk about all four. Um, the first one you had talked about what happened in the July 11th with the shutdown with, of the networks for flight. Um, we've got uh, technologies working, computing at the edge. That's really quite critical for aircraft to be able to make decisions in real time. You can imagine um, the data processing, the amount of sensors, um, artificial intelligence, uh, live agents applied to that. Um, that's important both in a setting of defense, where you have to operate land, space, see, and perceive. The, the aircraft has to perceive its environment and react to its environment. But I also be, believe that it's going to be important in a commercial aspect also, because the networks have gone down, right? So how do we balance the two, the ability for computing at the edge where it's critical versus network GPS enabled? So that's one area where there's, there's some technology synergies. Um, a second area is um, I want to talk about that speed. Um, I feel as a mom that we have to move so much faster towards security and sustainability. I worry about you know, a volume of commercial flight two, three, four times without addressing some of the factors that we've just discussed in sustainability. Uh, we are working very rapidly, and some of the uh, sessions this week are amazing in computational fluid dynamics. So what we've done, for example, with X-59, um, the Quest mission, is we filled in the science blanks <laughs> right, of supersonic flight. And then we started working speed, right, multi-fidelity physics modeling, 
um, scaling the fidelity of our analysis when we do gridding, moving from weeks to do analysis to hours. And we're moving now towards a multi-fidelity AI ML surrogate modeling capabilities, right? Based on physics, bringing in all the physics that you need to come in because you can't do AI alone. We, <laughs> we hear that frustration back from our scientists, right? Um, but we're moving much faster. That's in our toolbox now, which allows us to iterate very quickly. Um, the other area that I wanted to talk about uh, was in the area of um, sustainability and um, how we build our aircraft. We now have um, additive manufacturing. We can build structures near net, right? We can reduce our waste. Computational materials uh, engineering has advanced dramatically from ab initio calculations to molecular reactions all the way to full scale. So we can design in the properties we absolutely need and dramatically reduce production waste. Finally, in bioengineering, um, I really think that's something that we should be putting a lot more muscle into. We can use biomaterials in our production support almost immediately, and then move on to incorporating them into interiors, for example. So we have a lot we can do if we bring in uh, speed and affordability, and why do I equate, equate that to equality? If we don't address these things as we plan our work, it's just gonna be the super rich that get to fly supersonic or be space tourists. We have to build in design for cost up front. So I'll, I'll, I'll build on, back to your question, in terms of the dual use aspect. Um, the laws of physics for propulsion, for example, in, they don't care whether it's a commercial engine or a military engine. Yeah, the, you don't put big holes in a, in a military airplane for a variety of reasons, and to get efficiency, you need high bypass um, a lot of fan flow, but generally speaking, you optimize around the mission. And some of the new technologies are really well positioned. So for example, anything you do for urban air mobility is directly applicable for battlefield mobility. Delivering packages could be used to resupply front lines. Um, and when you look at hybrid electric in particular, we've sort of seen that right now with today's technology, there's a sweet spot in the market somewhere between a half a megawatt and a megawatt, which is enabling for urban air or battlefield mobility. For regional turboprop, a regional turboprop is about 2,000 um, shaft horsepower at sea level static. That's two megawatts. So you do about a 50-50. Um, so, so that's applicable. And then on the uh, commercial side, as I mentioned earlier, we're involved in some demos, the switch program in Europe, which is a hybrid electric single aisle engine which is about 5%. It's not about energy arbitrage from fuel to electric. It's about re-envisioning the cyber-physical controls of the propulsion system itself. Well, you can do that not only for commercial, but for military as well. And so a fighter aircraft today, we're starved for power and thermal management on board. And so um, if you made available that half a megawatt to a megawatt, electrical and thermal management, um, you could do, you can enable a lot of new systems in terms of electronic and potentially directed energy systems for the future. I'll just I'd double down on what Michael's saying. You know, beyond those capabilities, the kinds of things that make a difference in command control communications, the cyber and computing elements are also dual use. And anything that will enable these, you know, dramatically improved aviation, uh, airspace systems, uh, and vehicle technology of the future, you think also apply to how are we going to safely and effectively, safely, I'll use in quotes perhaps, uh, use new high volume, low cost systems of uh, autonomous uh, uh, objects, you know, the replicator program uh, in the 
DOD space. And so these are the kinds of technologies that we need to continue to advance very rapidly to take advantage of the broader space of new technologies, both on the civil and then on the military side. Yeah, I was Vic. just going to add, um, just like aviation and space, the lines are blurring. So are the lines between commercial technology and military technology in many instances, including the internet, as you know. But uh, going forward, I think deterrence in the military space is going to be important, and therefore intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance as a means for deterrence is going to be important. And a lot of the technologies we're talking about, even on the commercial side, uh, use that as their building blocks. And so I do think uh, there is a lot of synergy going forward. Vivek, I'm gonna, let's stick with you. I'm gonna ask the next question directly to you. And this is getting towards the, uh, how do we as the sector deal with disruption? The question to you is what must the incumbents of today what must they do to ensure that they are also the incumbents of the future or of that future scenario that we've been talking about? Uh, or in fact, simply that they remain alive and don't face their Kodak moment. What, what must they be doing today? Right, that's an excellent question, Russ. I think, um, you know, we, we live in a, in a world now, it's a globalized community um, no one country has a lock on the best ideas and no one country has a lock on the implementation of those ideas. And therefore, um, in this competitive environment, I think it's very important not only to advance technologies, but also do it at the right price point. I think moving into the future, the incumbents or the disruptors there has to be a lot of thinking done from a systems perspective, from a cost perspective, and um, not only focusing on getting the best technology because it is the best technology available. Uh, if you're going to compete, and countries compete, but certainly companies compete, if you're going to stay ahead of the game, not only do you need to have leapfrog technologies, but that's not enough. Doing it at the right cost point is also an important factor. The other aspect to this is, and we have not talked about this on the panel, but the maintenance, repair, and overhaul of whatever products we are building is, is the long tail here and, and where m much of the investment goes. So understanding how that piece fits into the product of our offering is very important. At a technology level, I mean, not these days AI is the buzzword. Well, AI, we all knew 40 years ago, uh, existed. So what does AI mean relative to the technology or, uh, in, in my view, advanced materials uh, is another area. I think that we have to keep leapfrogging in terms of technology and science there um, to, to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, going back to AI. It's now possible due to fast processors, it's now possible due to the SIM technologies, it's now possible to implement in a certain way. Not that it wasn't discovered 40 years ago, but its implementation exists today. And so timing all this into the future is gonna be very critical. Thoughts, Linda? I think the other thing is collaboration up front and technology development. So AI AA provides that venue, but we're all working with between defense and commercial companies and between the research institutes and the universities, um, creating that, not just advancing the technology with the collaboration, but advancing the relationships so we set up for business success. Yeah, that, that could equate to a compliance readiness level. As technology readiness level hit five or six, AIAA could start creating a culture of compliance, not later post-certification, as it has been historically. But why don't we pick the ARL 6-7? And why don't we have a compliance readiness level assessment, sustainability, safety, security? So when we deliver TRL 9s to the regulator, to the policymaker, we're delivering a compliance mm -hmm. solution as well at all levels. That's where I think AIAA could have a shift in 
how to embrace technology, not technology per se, but the compliance elements of technology. I think that could, uh, from the capital uh, point of view, that will uh, iron a lot of the wrinkles that we have in the system today. So anytime you have changes in a market, it's an opportunity to displace the incumbents. And so I started by talking about the mega trends, and I'll use the example of sustainability because it's, it's the easiest to talk about. How many countries can make a nuclear weapon? Somewhere between 19 and 21, depending on your count. How many can make a modern jet engine? Two and a half, maybe three. And so that's a technology that is likely to undergo change in the next decade or two. And so everybody else understands that, everybody tastes that. Other countries, other nation states are making the investments through their public-private partnerships because they want that. Two of those companies that can make that modern jet engine are based in the United States. And it is, uh, contributes to the largest uh, category in the balance of trade for the U.S. with an over excess of $60 billion on an annual basis, typically. And so other countries understand this, and they want that. So we all need to come together and work together collaboratively, especially through, you know, th through appropriate means to further those technologies and to invest in those public-private partnerships to advance the technologies and advance the understanding. Comment from Nick? Just quickly, the, the, uh, one of the issues, and it's, Michael raises a very good point, the idea that three countries on the planet who can develop a practical jet engine and put it into service uh, is mostly because the technologies inside that engine are so advanced and so hard to understand, and it takes you about 30 years to develop the thermodynamics and materials engineers to produce it. That's no longer true as we get better digitization of our systems. Um, I'll offer an example is that the helicopter record for uh, flying to meet a particular prize of building a man-powered helicopter to fly at 10 feet for one minute and maintain control was not met by the best institute in the United States at designing helicopters. I won't mention their name. It was not met by any of the teams in the United States who comprised the aerospace engineers. There was a Canadian group that had a man-powered vehicle and they knew how to make the engine the man and they actually looked up the code and bought some commercial software for the, for the rotors and ended up meeting the prize and beating everyone else on the planet. I'll offer that's an illustration of the fact that if we're not careful, the idea that there is large barriers to entry for people in major complex fields will no longer be true as the code is had around the world. And there'll be a democratization of the design of these systems, which in the end will help humanity overall. Kiyoki, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring the last question to you. Although we do have, we're gonna have time for one or two audience questions. Um, but Kiyoki, a question for you, and you know that this one's going to be dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. While we get on with developing quite disruptive technologies, our workforce demographics is rapidly changing, as is the world of business models. Um, think Uber, think Airbnb as examples. What would need to be the standout attribute of our future workforce and the standout attribute of the future leaders of that workforce? I, I guess, first of all, I'm challenged to, you know, talk leadership for somebody who actually teaches at one of the top uh, business schools in the world. But, you know, it, I, I think as you look at what is so important at AIAA and why we're here, for me, this question really resonates because it gets after what is the reality of our future, and it is arguably the people who are going to develop all these technologies and integrate these technologies and operate uh, and deploy. And so that's where, if we're going to make a big strategic difference, uh, that's where our focus should be. And I think that's something that all of us who have had the opportunity to lead in organizations in aerospace uh, and defense, that's, that's something that we share. So we've talked a lot about these disruptions. And you know, I think we've seen over the last couple of years that disruptions come in all kinds of flavors 
whether pandemics or technological. Uh, and so being able to predict what that might be is, is challenging at best. What do they say? It's uh, always difficult to make projections, especially about the future. Um, so then I'm going to also say we love our technology, we love our science, we love our research and development, we love our engineering. So I'm going to take it as a given that we have that already sitting here in the room. And this is, in fact, the Olympiad of aerospace, right? So that's, that's sort of the price of entry. What beyond that then? And I think that gets to three particular areas. One is the idea of adaptability. And I will say, as I look at the folks that we're trying to hire at MITRE today, it, we have an interesting mix of people who I'd say fresh out of school, you know, PhDs uh, and advanced degrees, and are ready to take on just about anything. We also have a mix of people who are deeply experienced and have a long history in their domains. And that, there's a certain amount of magic to bringing that all together. But as I reflect on what we need today, we're shifting the balance of how we hire, and it's not one or the other, but very much toward the type of folks that you know, can adapt to what the needs of a different mission or a different risk environment or a different challenge will be. And so folks that really are Renaissance people that can bring the combination of great technical depth, but also are curious, who have breadth, who are interested in the connections. So that kind of gets me to the second piece. We're hiring for people that can connect. And that is critically important. All the challenges that you heard about today, that's not just technical connections, it's policy connections. It's you know, environmental considerations. So these are the places where I believe in what we're seeing here uh, play out at MITRE is finding those people who can make those connections and then leverage those connections to do something unique and disruptive. And then the third, and this gets to the, the disruption piece, this idea of a growth mindset and that idea that we're not living in a fixed world, but really a world where it's been expressed as a world of abundance and the opportunity to do almost an infinite variety of things, that requires a mindset of continuous development and continuous growth as well. So then what kind of leaders do we need? And maybe the stupid answer is, well, we need the leaders that can enable those folks that I just talked about. Oh, practically speaking, what does that mean? And I want to ground this a little bit in the business context. There was an interesting study by McKinsey that came out uh, not too long ago. And it talked about the losses that are, being, uh, that are being realized today because of talent gaps. And for a median airspace and defense company, that's estimated to be on the order of 300 to $330 million a year. So not an insignificant uh, investment in waste, essentially. So what are the things that we need to think about there? I, I would also say, what do people care about as they're coming into the workforce? And there's a couple of things that make people join and make people stay, and those have to do with meaningful work. They also, interestingly, have to do with the colleagues and the coworkers that you're in with. So it is that environment as much as anything else. Why do people leave? They don't find opportunities for advancement. They don't find opportunities to continue to grow both professionally uh, and in their personal uh, experience at work. And so those are the challenges that we see leaders having to address. So if I were to lay out a couple of things, you know, the first would be really understanding that range of generations that Russ and others talked about earlier today and applying a focus on organizational health as much as anything. And one interesting thing that I saw in the McKinsey paper that I found deeply personally painful is that 70% of aerospace and defense companies have worse organizational health index scores globally than the median for advanced industries, think uh, you know, advanced technology industries. So we got some work to do here as leaders across the industry. So maybe I'll just end on that note, that the, the measure of leadership, a, a wonderful gentleman named Max Dupree said, he, was, he, he worked for a furniture company, Herman Miller, which you'd say, well, what does that have to do with aerospace? 
I would argue that the, the integration of human-centered design and of incredible you know, technology insertion that verge, uh, verges on art, that's what we do every day, and it requires a certain kind of a person to do that. He said, the measure of leadership is not the quality of the head, but the tone of the body. So again, not the quality of the head, but the tone of the body. So focusing on that organizational health will bring in the kinds of people that love to do the kinds of work that we think have you know, it's motivated all of us for so many years. And I will also give a shout out on that front to AIAA, because if you think about some of the things that are in AIAA strategic goals, I'll just rattle off a couple. One is focus on engagement. Incredibly important to the workforce uh, and the connections that we need. Uh, the second, and I want to make sure I get this right, it is developing volunteers and leaders for the future of AIAA, so that focus on growth and development. And then the third one I'll highlight, and this is so important in a world where we're thinking about this incredible diversity of our workforce today and in the future, but reflecting in AIAA's members and leaders the diversity of our society. So kudos to AIAA on tackling some of those really important leadership challenges for the future. Anybody? Just, just wanted to add, I think that was outstanding, uh, Kyoki. Um, I think ethics and integrity are going to be so important going into the future. It's important today. It's, it was important in, in our history. But into the future, as we look at these future aviation transportation systems, certifications, et cetera, one leadership attribute uh, and, and leadership at every level, whether you're talking technical or, or managerial, will be ethics and integrity. And that, that attribute cannot be foot stomped enough, I, I believe. Linda? Yeah, I, I really resonated with what you said. Uh, one area that I'm concerned about is, is diversity. So if you look at the universities and you look at aero degrees, we're still very, very, very low with women and people of color. And I'm wondering if we can do something different, both in the universities and AIAA, where we start looking at multidisciplinary education. We talked this whole time about computing, right? Software, propulsion, right? We talked about all the dis bioengineering. Oh, we should be hiring, and we should be growing, and we should be cross-training degrees across all the engineering and science disciplines in order to meet this mission. Michael, I think you were going to say something before. Um, well, I'll just add, I, it's hard to build on uh, the remarks that Kyogi had, but um, one of the things that we've observed is over the last two decades, really, we've lost a lot of talent to tech and in, in our industry. And there's, there's this gap in the demographic. And um, as we look towards sustainable aviation, as we look towards new space, uh, commercial space, and as we look towards um, defending freedom, uh, perhaps this is now a time to inspire the next generation of students that aviation's cool again. And so um, bring them back. Always was. Nick, last comment from Nick. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on what Linda said and, and uh, expand it. I think if you were to look at the system that we have today that produces engineers, that starts with kids at six or seven or eight years old who show the proclivity, young women and young men who have a proclivity for math and for science and the love of materials and things, and then we end up producing a graduate engineer, that space between those two milestones could not be less efficient if we tried. And you said something in the earlier session that I picked up on. To take a young man or young woman and move them to a city a thousand miles away, live in a dormitory, and expend four years of their lives to become an engineer, I would bet 80% of the content of the expense and the bother is not in engineering. Because our system is designed around Oxford University in the year 1550. What are we doing today with regard to Zoom and other things to help to democratize education 
I can only tell you the failure of our society is that there are young women in Iowa who know how to repair a tractor and they'll never think of going to engineering school and they don't have the money because one of the great it's too ways expensive. Our, oh, our society cleaves itself with regard to uh, economics. So that those on the lower side of the economic scale have no idea of how to get to college and then just turn it off. So I'll, I'll leave those as challenges, if you will. And I'm gonna take one question from the audience, the highest voted question. And it's actually a, a good, uh, it's an extremely good one. And it, it builds on uh, comments that Kyoki was making. When you look to the future of aviation, what other industries would it benefit us to work with or learn from? And, and this, this also builds on the horizon scanning uh, approach. What's going on out there over the fence in other sectors? Does anybody want to respond to that? Well, very, very quickly, out of the 8 billion people on this planet, only 20% have ever set foot on an aircraft. That was a very, very uh, awakening figure for me. So if you ask me what multimodal interaction uh, could be uh, for us to watch is the automobile industry. Um, from five billion people trips last year to 10 billion by 2040, forecast by ICAO, the increase, the, when 90% when of the eight billion people have flown on an airplane, we'll have to quadruple, quintuple our fleet. The automobile industry knows how to scale up. I, I keep an eye on that. I would like to say that uh, the universities uh, are, are a very important tool that we have to interact with a lot more, not just domestically, but in the international domain. And the universities provide such a great fertile ground to, to do that, to expand joint R&D and collaboration. So I think, although a lot is being done, I think a lot more investment need to go, needs to go into the universities and work more jointly with industry. Any other thoughts, Nick? The idea of investing in education for youngsters is an investment that pays itself royally. Uh, as an index of that, the United States changed its entire outlook during the end of World War II with the GI Bill. The GI Bill meant that every soldier had a chance to go to college, and it was discovered that about seven million Americans who would never have college on their horizon had college paid for by the GI Bill. And the advancement of American society in the 50s and 60s was the direct result of the number of managers, scientists, engineers that were put into the society on the basis of that. What was discovered was that every dollar spent on the GI Bill gained almost $3 in income tax. So it was actually a bargain and investment. I contend that could be done today. I'll throw a maybe non-obvious one out there, but if we're really gonna seize the seeds of disruption here and disrupt ourselves, it does require a very different mindset, whether in industry or in government. And we've got some folks who have lived in the venture capital world here and the idea that uh, you would invest in things where maybe one in 10 is gonna work out. Those are the kinds of things that we're gonna need to do if we're gonna tackle these challenges, whether it's the green the, the, or sustainable fuels challenge or the challenge of getting safety down by orders of magnitude given what Nick talked about and the uh, number of things we're gonna have flying around out there in the not too distant future. So to the panel, I want to give them each 30 seconds or less, because we've got just over three and a half minutes left in the session, 30 seconds or less. Your last thoughts. We'll start from Oscar and work our way back to Kiyoki. Okay, my, my last thought, um, we have an opportunity, and this event that blends aviation with space for the first time gives us an opportunity to cross-pollinate both realms to tackle some of the most challenging uh, issues that we've discussed, including compliance at all levels. So think about blending aviation and space frameworks and constructs. I think we can get a lot of low-hanging fruit there. So for, you know, we started with the Jetsons. What would, uh, uh, a similar thing today, look for the future? So 60 years from now, 
what is that? What is, what is justice of today? I think we need to think about that, but I think what is very critical will be the diversity piece that Linda talked about, because that's, I think, a, a building block, and the other is international collaborations. Disruption can be uncomfortable, um, or it could provide phenomenal opportunity. And it's up to us and everybody here at this conference to be the leaders of the future and realize our bright future. I'll build on what Linda was talking about. I, I think the aerospace industry is uh, monochromatic. I think that, we, generally speaking, um, we came from the same backgrounds. We, we look the same. We, we talk the same. And, and that is, sets up rife for disruption because it keeps you from thinking um, outside uh, the box. And the, the companies, the new co's of the world coming up have huge pocketbooks and, and no sense of history necessarily and are happy to go spend um, a lot of money to go leapfrog and bypass some of the some of the history as you said you can go out and buy the code and 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 launch we go so we really need to do a better job of um, creating a, a more diverse atmosphere yeah excellent okay. um, Russ you mentioned something earlier in this previous talk about Jack Welch and a coach and the idea of what are you doing what are you working on uh, is it possible for the AIAA to align itself to have an overlook that asks these kinds of questions of ourselves and answers them. Right now you're organized in terms of, you know, to, to technical challenges and technical leaps, but it, maybe it's not technical we're talking about. There's also the question of how we harness ourselves to move forward. To answer what Bob said, what Linda said, what, what I think I've talked about, the idea that there is a whole capability to raise a crop of people that could help us in the future, and how do we do that? And maybe AIAA could be organized to do that. Linda. Uh, ethics. We face opportunities, huge, enormous opportunities, and we face huge risks in a very challenging climate. And I want all of us in our companies, our universities, to build in uh, back in and strengthen ethics in engineering and scientific design when you think about what's going on with artificial intelligence and pulling, um, you know, open source software, it is, becomes absolutely imperative to really examine ethics as a community in the products that we build. I first would say uh, learn from them, but I, I do think about the, that first slide that popped up. And so we're in the business, I would say, of making the miraculous mundane. I want to fly on that, <laughs> that human hypersonic aircraft. And if we're going to make that happen, we are going to have to work collaboratively uh, in spite of some of our, our instincts. And we're going to have to think from the outset in terms of resilience and robustness and safety because those are the things that are gonna allow us to accelerate that future that we've all been talking about today. So thank you to Russell, thank you to this entire panel. It really has been marvelous. Monday, I'm gonna quote you. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, as I hand out to each of our panelists a token of appreciation from AIAA, please thank them. Mm -hmm.